Today we have a big in-depth review of this. This is a Debouillet Affinity Line Stainless Steel Frying Pan. Does a fancy French skillet like this deserve a place on your stovetop? Let's find out. Hi and welcome to Uncle Scott's Kitchen. It's a great day here at Uncle Scott's Kitchen. Why? Because we get to review a brand new fancy frying pan. One of my favorite things to do. This one is made by Debouillet. We've done a lot of reviews of Debouillet's products around here. They are a high-end, fancy French cookware manufacturer. They make all kinds of great stuff. They make baking supplies, mandolin slicers, knives, we tend to focus on the cookware around here, especially the top end of their lines. This one here, this new pan, is part of their Affinity line. They market it as a luxury line of pans. Now let me translate something for you. If you hear the word luxury in conjunction with a French line of cookware, that means get out your wallet. This one here cost me about $250. $250 for a frying pan. Wow. My wife is going to be ticked when she sees that on her credit card. But this is a good time to bring up the fact that we do buy all of our own pans with our own money around here. I think it makes the reviews as hopefully unbiased as possible. These are not review copies. They are not provided to us for any kind of marketing purposes buy these things with our own money. So even though it's a luxury line of pans, it looks really nice just first time I pick it up, it still needs to deliver on cooking performance. So what we're going to do in today's video, this affinity line is new to me, so what we're going to do is kind of go through some information about the line, go through this pan stats and vitals and features, really get to know it. We're going to give it a quick wash. You know, we review so many carbon steel skillets around here where you have to clean beeswax off and season the pan before you start cooking. Kind of a breath of fresh air to review a stainless steel where we can just start cooking. And then we're really going to look at a few things. Build quality, I want to see how the pan performs, and I'm really interested in mostly how it cooks food. Does it heat evenly? Are there hot spots? Can you use this pan to produce a delicious supper? Who knows? Let's jump in and get started. So this Affinity line is new to North America. New to us, they've been out in Europe for a while now, but this is the first time we can really get our hands on them. The Affinity line features polished stainless steel pans. They come in a variety of shapes and sizes, sauce pans, saute pans, stew pans, on and on. Uh, the surface is so shiny, in fact, that my camera really had a difficult time focusing on the surface. It ended up focusing on the reflection reflected off the surface. Now, these Affinities are five-layer pans. They have a, an 1810 stainless steel cooking surface. Then in the middle, there are three different layers of aluminum aluminum cores, and then you've got a magnetic induction compatible stainless steel exterior. So that's really nice because you'll be able to use these on gas, electric, and induction. We'll definitely do some checking on those flat tops here in a few minutes. Now those interior layers, they go up the sides of the pan. They're not just like a disc on the bottom, they go all the way up the sides. Maybe not quite as important in a frying pan, you're not going to do a lot of cooking up the sides of the pan. But if you had one of the sauce pans, going to do some boiling or making soup or stew or what have you, a sauce, that heat transferring up the sides could be very important. This handle, I think it looks really nice. It's made out of cast stainless steel. That means it's heat tolerant. It can go in the oven. It can withstand higher temperatures. It's got a nice thumb groove. So when you hold it, your thumb fits in there pretty nicely. And on the bottom, it's kind of subtle, but there are small finger grooves on the bottom. It really gives you a nice grip. The instructions say the pan is dishwasher safe. I don't want to do that. If I pay $250 for a fancy frying pan, I'm going to baby it. I'm going to wash mine by hand. That's what I recommend you do. But you could throw it in the dishwasher if you really want to. The one we're reviewing today is the 32 centimeter model. 
in a measurement system that my brain understands that's roughly 12 and a half, 12.6 inches, edge to edge. Get a little over nine inches of cooking surface down at the bottom. And as far as weight and maneuverability, let's compare it to a couple of its cousins. This is a Debouillet 12 and a half inch Mineral B Pro carbon steel. A little over six pounds, very heavy, not very maneuverable. This is a Debouillet, almost impronounceable. E no cuivre. Copper, stainless steel line, copper pan. This one weighs in at about a little over five pounds. And this new Affinity, same size pan, weighs in at almost four, just a little bit under four. So it's moderately heavy, but not nearly as heavy as these guys. I think it still feels substantial, yet you can move it around. Can't really do that with those other pans, not very easily anyway. Now we've reviewed so many carbon steel skillets around here that it's kind of surprising to me that I can just give this thing a wash and start cooking. It's stainless steel, non-reactive. You can use tomatoes, you can use vinegar, you can use acidic ingredients, you can deglaze with wine, not have to worry about any of that seasoning. So I just had a great idea here. Let's give this thing a quick wash and do some cooking. Cooking tests. I've given this pan a quick wash, a hug for good luck, and I note this is the shiniest and best and most pristine this pan will ever look ever again. It's going from a show pan to a working pan. For the cooking test, let's start off with a few basic items to learn how the pan cooks. Then we'll jump up to things like eggs, which take a little finagling and stainless steel, and then some fancier in-depth dishes and high temp sear tests. I'm going to start out on the old fancy gas stove here and cook some fried potatoes and fried okra. For the potatoes, I simply cubed up some russets, soaked them for a while, rinsed them, dried them, and I'm going to cook those in veggie oil. For the fried okra, I'm going to use my mom's recipe and method. Very simple, you just take your raw okra, it is kind of naturally sticky. Remember that for later. Roll it in cornmeal, salt, pepper, and a shake of cayenne when my wife isn't looking. That cornmeal will stick to that naturally sticky okra. Heating up the oil for the potatoes, it takes about a minute and a half to two minutes for the pan to come up to temperature and my test potatoes to start sizzling just a little bit. I kind of like seeing this one guy slide around a little bit already here. In go the potatoes. And I give the pan a shake. And I'm getting good browning and no sticking. I really like that, cooking on somewhere around medium heat, maybe a skosh higher, but definitely not on high heat. Nothing sticking. For the fried okra, same thing. Give the pan a shake, the okra releases, it's sliding around, it's browning up nicely. Okay, so the immediate takeaways here, I'm getting good heat distribution. I'm getting sizzling and frying edge to edge. The pan seems to be cooking very evenly. I like that. It's also doing that on both a medium gas burner and a smaller gas burner. So I think that gas flame kind of gives it a nice even heat. Also, the food is not sticking. If you're frying food like this and you notice that it's sticking, if you have to use a spatula to get it off the pan, Try just adjusting the temperature you're cooking at. You'll find that if you adjust the temperature just a little bit, the food will release and not stick. So I like being able to slide these things. Awesome. Next up, bacon. Bacon. Can you get non-stick bacon in a stainless steel skillet? Yes, you can. Now there are many methods for cooking bacon out there. Some people say you should start it in water and boil it dry and then let it fry. Some people put it on a baking sheet, cook it in their oven. Those are all fine and dandy. What I like to do is just start mine in a cold pan, fry it like normal, and it seems to work very well. What I'm doing here is adding six strips of normal sized bacon to the Affinity. Six fit pretty well in this larger pan, not going too far up the sides. Started out in a cold pan. I turned the burner on on low, starting it on a smaller burner. And what I do here is keep an eye on it. When I notice a little bit of grease and fat rendering out of the bacon, I go ahead and give it a couple of early turns. Once that starts to happen, you can go ahead and increase the heat. I move this over to a medium burner and the bacon doesn't stick. It doesn't stick. 
think it fried up very nicely. And one thing I want to note here, we mentioned that that core, that aluminum core in this pan, goes all the way up the sides of the pan. I started some of this bacon laying up the side of the pan, and I thought it cooked pretty nicely. I think that heat did transfer up there, and it may just be me, but I don't think the ends of the bacon are quite as curly as they would have been on other pans. Okay, now let's turn up the heat a smidge and brown some beef. Now, whether this is for taco night or for sloppy joe night, a big fancy French pan like this, even though it's really expensive and high end, still needs to handle day to day cooking tasks with ease. In goes my beef. I think this comes from Square Cow. It already looks amazing. So again here, I started this meat in a cold pan. As I brought the pan up to temperature, I broke up the meat, gradually went up to higher heat, and it browned up nicely. Notice that there's no sticking at first as I pull the spatula through the meat, there's nothing stuck to the pan. Of course, I'm not really trying to make a hamburger fond, but I note that later in the cooking, as the meat got browner and browner, I did get a few nice sticky bits near the end of cooking. And one reason I want to show this is the last time we reviewed a carbon steel skillet, I browned some beef, I was going to make sloppy joes, and I chickened out. I didn't put the sloppy joe sauce in the pan with the beef because I was worried it had tomatoes, it had vinegar in the sauce. I didn't want to damage that pan seasoning. With stainless steel, no big deal, not a care in the world. I dumped the sauce in that vinegar and those tomatoes kind of deglaze any of those sticky hamburger bits from the bottom. And with stainless steel, I ain't scared of no sloppy joe. Okay, things are going well so far, so let's pop down to the basement where I have an electric flat top and an induction burner and do some checking down there. What could possibly go wrong? So let's start on the electric flat top and fry some zucchini and squash. Now when I review a pan, I usually cook these early on. I think it's a good test for hot spots. I can get these things arranged around the bottom of a pan and if they all brown at the same rate, that tells me that the pan is cooking evenly and there are no major hot spots to worry about. And normally I dip these in milk, I dredge them in flour, I dip them in milk again, then into breadcrumbs and then I fry them up. Those breadcrumbs, they toast up, give them a nice crunch and texture. But the other day, I was on the internet, on YouTube, and a video popped up by this hillbilly lady. And she was talking about all these people on the internet, these crazy people doing crazy things like dipping their squash. And I thought, well, maybe she's talking about me. Am I one of these crazy internet squash dippers? I might be. She says that if you cut up your squash, the squash will become naturally sticky and you can just dredge them in cornmeal in a Ziploc bag cornmeal will stick and then you can fry them up. No batter needed. And I know that is almost exactly the way I cook that okra. The okra is naturally sticky. So not wanting to lead anyone astray down the path of unnecessary squash dipping, I decided to give her recipe a try. Got my squash sliced up, got them in the Ziploc, got the cornmeal, the salt, pepper, shake of cayenne in there. Let them rest, followed the recipe to a T, and Nothing really stuck to mine. My squash did not get sticky at all. Now, I don't know if it's because I'm in Utah where the air is really dry. Maybe the humidity or lack thereof has something to do with the stickiness. Maybe it's a different variety of squash. I don't know, but that recipe did not work for me. Decided to go ahead and cook them anyway, and I gotta say, I am not impressed. I'm not a fan of that recipe. No offense to the hillbilly lady. Might work for her, did not work for me. Uh, these things, they kind of turned into soggy little olive oil sponge grease bombs. Not really what you want. Now, I think the pan did just fine on the electric flat top. It heated evenly. I tried it on one of the larger burners. And I just got to say, I'm going to go back to being a crazy internet squash dipper where I feel like I truly belong. While I'm down here, let's get out the old induction burner. Now, I've had a love-hate with this burner actually more of a hate hate it has scorched some pans it does very odd heating patterns on some of the carbon steel where you get kind of a hot scorched ring in the center not much heating out towards the edges i was really worried about putting the affinity on the induction burner i got to say i put these potatoes in there i heated the pan slowly don't want any warping issues and look at this i'm getting nice even heating Nice sizzling edge to edge, no hot spot in the middle, thank goodness. And I gotta say, 
Of all the pans I have reviewed, this Affinity is by far the best I've used on induction. Okay, with all the preliminaries out of the way, we've shown that the pan heats evenly. Nice cooking edge to edge. We've used it on gas and the flat tops. Let's bump up now and do some actual cooking. Let's start with eggs. Talk about a crazy internet person. We're gonna cook eggs in stainless steel. I'm gonna start out with some scrambled. I've got four scrambled eggs here. And I should note here that I have a sixth sense. A sixth sense. I can tell when someone is going to complain about butter. Here it comes. So I got my pan heating up, back up on the gas stove top here, in goes a ton of butter. Yes, butter. I'm going to implement what I call the French pan rule here. If you're using a French frying pan, you can use as much butter as you want. There you go. The French pan rule. And the key here is to make sure the pan is hot enough, get that butter melted in there, make sure it's crackling and sizzling. Then add your eggs at the right time, and look at this. Scrambled eggs and stainless steel, not sticky. Now it's not just the butter, you gotta get the temperature of the pan correct. If you add eggs to a pan that's too cold, they're gonna fuse like cement, as we're gonna see here with trying a French omelet. Have I lost my mind? Maybe. Now generally speaking, a stainless steel skillet would not be my go-to pan for a French omelet. In fact, my go-to pan for a French omelet is a French omelet pan. This one, a carbon steel, also made by Debouillet. Fantastic egg pan, and another cousin to this guy. But let's lose our minds and try a French omelet in a stainless steel pan anyway. First try, had the pan too cold, eggs stuck like a duck, as my son likes to say. Had to scrape those out of there. Next try, I tried a little more butter, a little bit longer heating. It got a little closer, but not quite there. This try, I got the entire omelet sliding around. No sticking, notice that the entire omelet is sliding around the pan. The problem here is when I turn the pan up to kind of roll that omelet up, the darn thing almost slid all the way out of the pan. Kind of a good problem to have, right? And after a little more trial and error, adjusting the number of eggs, the heat and all, this one, it needs a little straightening, but it came out pretty darn close. Kind of happy with that one. So you can cook eggs and French omelets in stainless steel, but it just takes a little more finagling and a little bit of practice. Side note here, I note that when learning to cook eggs in a new pan, it's very difficult. Why? Because you have to waste some food. Food is expensive these days. We're all brought up to never waste food. There are kids starving somewhere. Never waste food. But when it comes to learning how to cook eggs in a new skillet, you just gotta go through some eggs. It's mentally tough. And it probably took me two dozen eggs and five or six omelets to get my technique down in this pan. But now I can do it. But man, was it hard to throw those eggs away. Regardless though, I got a sliding French omelet in a stainless steel skillet. I'm feeling pretty good now. What could make me feel even better? And the kicker. Now I'm feeling a little nauseous already. So around here, I think about 10% of the audience here at Uncle Scott's Kitchen is vegetarian. So we always need to fix a few things for them. Why? Because it's nice to be nice to everyone. Someone write that down. Now this 12 and a half inch pan will hold four Beyond Meat patties, but gastronomically, I don't think I can stomach that many. So let's do a mix of two Beyond Meats and fill in the rest of the space with these nugs. So I got my oil heating up, in they go. Joking aside, I think it's important to keep a few of these around these days for lots of different situations. For example, my three-year-old just started piano lessons, and I find that they are also very effective if you stick one in each ear. <laughs> Back to the fake meats. 
Biggest mess of anything I cooked, even worse than the bacon. The aroma is that of burning plastic to me. I got those chiseled out, and I have to say I'm not really interested in deglazing and making a Beyond Meat pan sauce. So we'll clean that up later. The nugs, on the other hand, were a little bit of a surprise. They didn't stick, they fried up nicely, and after eating a few of them, although it took my brain a few minutes to really process what was happening, they actually seem pretty good, believe it or not. Now they don't taste a darn thing like chicken to me, but at the same time, if someone had said, here is a nice fried crunchy veggie popper and gave me one, they're actually pretty decent. But looking at that Beyond Meat mess, let's take a moment here to talk about cleanup. Most food washed out with a scrubby sponge and dish soap, but a few things needed some extra attention. Bacon left that weird bacon film in the pan that remains even after washing. A little white vinegar takes care of that in no time flat. Sometimes oil would darken and get sticky up near the rim of the pan. So for any sticky, stuck-on, half-seasoned oil stuff that won't come off with a sponge and dishwashing liquid, use some Barkeeper's Friend. That's what I've been using, or one of its competitors, something like that. It's got some sort of acid and some micro-abrasives in there that really power through any of that stuck-on, burnt-on oil. And remember how I talked about how shiny the pan was when it was new? This is what the bottom looks like now after I've moved it around on iron grates about a zillion times. I've also used metal utensils in the interior, got a few scratches there. But to me, this just indicates that someone has cooked something delicious. Not a show pan, it's a working pan. Pan fried pork chops. My mom used to cook these all the time when I was growing up. Still like to make them today, and now we're moving up to kind of more real deal cooking with this new affinity. Pan fried pork chops. These are thin. My wife floured and seasoned them. Into hot veggie oil they go. Let them cook up, and they browned up nicely and evenly. Now we're gonna cook some thicker pork chops here in a few minutes, ones that I don't wanna get quite this done on the outside. But for these thin pan fried ones, I like a little browning and a little chew to them. That's the way we ate them growing up and I still like them that way to this day. So I removed the pork chops from the pan. Notice that we got some sticky bits here and here I want to show how we can use the Affinity Pan to make a nice pan sauce. So we gotta give credit where credit is due. My wife saw a recipe for a mushroom sauce on Chef John P. Ayer's YouTube channel. This one is based on that. I'll put up a link to his recipe somewhere around this video. Not exactly the same, but pretty darn close. So she chopped up a bunch of shallots, garlic, and mushrooms and got those ready. We drained most of the grease out of the pan, but left the sticky pork bits. We added butter, she added shallots, and we cooked those down. Added mushrooms, again, cooked those down. When those were ready, she added tomato paste, kind of toasted it up a little. Then she added garlic, added spices. Then added some red wine, got everything deglazed. And notice how well and evenly this sauce reduced down. Really like the performance of the pan here. Then she added some stock and again reduced the sauce. Then at the end, she added some cream and butter. You know, slathered over a fried pork chop makes a really nice light weeknight meal. The only thing we messed up here was the timing. It took about 20-25 minutes to make that sauce, so the pork had actually cooled down a little bit by the time we got the sauce ready and on top. And to me that means I might need a second affinity pan so that we could get the timing down and get everything ready at once. Quick pasta sauce. Speaking of reducing sauces, let's make this quick and easy pasta sauce. The amount of flavor and deliciousness you get out of this versus the work you have to put into it, it's a fantastic ratio for a weeknight. You just heat some olive oil. In go some red pepper flakes, several crushed and chopped garlics, in go a bunch of cherry tomatoes. Side note here, these are fresh. My mother-in-law grew these in her backyard. Little shout out there. Cook them until they pop and release their juices. Squish them up, let them reduce down, let them simmer for a while. I think I cooked these about 12 to 15 minutes. 
It makes a fantastic sauce over some pasta it goes. I like the sweetness of the tomatoes with a little bit of contrast from the spice of that red pepper. Absolutely delicious and a fresh pasta sauce doesn't get much quicker or easier than this. <laughs> Pork Provençal. We're doing some real cooking now. This recipe is all about pork and potatoes. I started making it a few years back based on a recipe I saw on Food Network's site. I'll put up a link somewhere around the video. But what I love about this recipe for a pan review is A, it's delicious, and B, there is a lot going on in the pan. It really highlights what a pan can do. So I've got a lot of fresh ingredients here. I cubed up some Yukon Golds and have them soaking. I've also got garlic, thyme, half tomatoes, Kalamata olives, white wine, capers, chicken stock, and for the chops, I'm going to use thicker ones here, almost an inch thick. Now these are going to be browned and then finished up in a sauce. I like the thicker pork chops here because there is less risk of overcooking them. I'm going to get those floured up, seasoned, and ready to go. Drained and rinsed the potatoes, dried those out. And I've got the Affinity Pan on a gas burner, heating up some olive oil. Into the pan, those potatoes go on medium to medium high heat. Notice that they're not sticking. And I'm going to cook these until they've just started to brown, but are not yet completely done. Once that happens, I'm going to scooch, scooch the potatoes over and brown the pork chops on the other half of the pan. What I love about this and what drew me to Food Network's recipe is you cook the potatoes and the pork in the pan at the same time. What I find to be really amazing is that for the potatoes on one half of the pan, I want to brown them but have them to be non-stick. On the other half of the pan at the same time, I'm going to brown the pork chops and I do want them to stick a little bit. I want some stuck on sticky bits left at the bottom of the pan to make a sauce. But it just blows my mind to be stick and non-stick in the same pan at the same time. So I let those pork chops brown for about two minutes on each side. And again, I want to be careful here to not over brown them. I don't want them as brown as those pan fried thin chops we showed earlier. Don't want to overcook them. When they look about right, I put them on top of the potatoes. And see that stuck on sticky stuff there? On top of it, I'm going to add the olives, the thyme, and the capers. I'm going to wait a minute or so and then add the fresh garlic. I don't want it to get overdone. Then in go my halved tomatoes and white wine. They nicely deglaze those sticky bits and incorporate those into the sauce that we're building here. Then I nestle my pork chops down in that sauce amongst the potatoes. I'm going to add some chicken stock here and let everything reduce until we get a nice thick pan sauce. Now I use a meat thermometer here and when the internal temperature of those thick pork chops gets up around 140, 145, I go ahead and remove those from the sauce. Then I put the chops on a platter, pour the potatoes and sauce mix all around. And I think not only does it look good, I think this is absolutely delicious. The tanginess of the capers along with the tomatoes, a little zing from that white wine, really complements the pork and the potatoes really well. Fantastic wheat night meal. Now for the grand finale, another Beyond Meat patty. Just kidding, how about a couple of big, thick, juicy ribeye steaks? Oh yeah, and what I wanna check here is whether the pan cooks well with a high temp sear test. We're going to sear the heck out of these steaks on the stove top. Then we're gonna move them to a hot oven. Can the pan go from stove top to oven? Let's see. Now for my steaks, I don't do anything fancy. No sous vide, no reverse sear. I just cannot mentally process taking a nice piece of meat like this, putting it in a plastic bag and soaking it in water. I just, I don't know, it may be delicious, but my brain just does not process that. All we do is kind of the old fogey simple method. Take the meat out of the fridge an hour or so before we're gonna cook it. Right before I'm gonna put it in the pan, I rub it down with some salt and pepper. Then I get this Affinity pan just screaming hot on my big gas burner. I flick some water in the pan, and when it's rolling around like ball bearings, I know that the pan is hot. Add a little bit of oil, and then in go those steaks. And 
holy cow, they are browning up very, very nicely. I add some butter and some fresh rosemary to the pan. Kind of give those a good base. So I've got a fantastic crust developing on the outside. Took about two minutes per side, more or less. Just keep an eye on it. Keep them basted with that butter. And then what we do is take the pan and stick it in a 400 degree oven. For us, it takes about six minutes. And when we do this, that gets that internal temperature up to 130, 135, somewhere around there. And they're kind of in that medium rare to medium range where we like our steaks. But they cook absolutely perfectly. And as for the affinity, I could not be happier with this pan. It did great with the high temp sear on the stove top. Also that handle was just fine going into that hot oven. When you take a pan like this out of the oven though, make sure you put a mitt or towel on that handle. Can't tell from looking at it, but that thing is screaming hot. I make this mistake over and over. I always grab a hot handle. Bonus tip here, don't do that. Okay, so I have been cooking very heavily in this Debouille Affinity pan for a couple of weeks now. I'm at about 30 pans of real world, real meal cooking in this thing. I'm really impressed and this is a fantastic frying pan. Almost everything we cooked turned out really well with the exception of those hillbilly squash. There I blame the recipe and those Beyond Meat patties kind of stuck a little bit. Not sure who to blame for those. Everything else though, I was really impressed with. Now, with the aluminum core in this pan, I did get very nice even heating. I got nice cooking edge to edge, particularly on the gas stove top. Now you get that gas flame underneath one of these things and it's just a pleasure to cook with. But even on the electric flat top and that induction, still got nice even heating and got nice frying edge to edge in those pans. And I gotta say on that induction burner of all the pans I have reviewed, this Affinity pan performed by far better than any of the others. So I really do like that. And we used the pan to cook a variety of foods. Some things we wanted non-stick, like the veggies that slid around. Sometimes we wanted things to stick and make a bit of a fond, like when we browned meat. We did that, we cooked eggs. We had pretty good luck with eggs, I gotta say, in a stainless steel pan. We reduced pan sauces. We did high temp sears going from stovetop to the oven. And this thing, it just performed flawlessly. I really do like this pan. So for the Debouillet French made five ply affinity stainless steel line frying pan, that was a mouthful. I really do like this thing. This is gonna be my go-to frying pan when I need stainless steel. I like it a lot and I give it an enthusiastic thumbs up. Now, if you want to get one of these things for yourself, make sure you check out the shopping links below. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Check out the links somewhere on this screen for other videos you might like. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you again next time on Uncle Scott's Kitchen.